Hello and welcome to this clinician's coffee chat on diabetes and nutrition. I'm Lily Catalano, project manager for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council in Nashville. This webinar is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as part of an award totaling $1,625,741 with 0% financed with non-governmental sources. The contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. Um, for more information, please visit hrsa.gov. This is the last of a four-part coffee chat series on topics related to diabetes. We call them coffee chats because they're informal conversations. We invite you to get a cup of coffee or your lunch, depending on where you are in the country, and or your day, and listen and discuss. Uh, this is an opportunity for all of us to share tips and challenges and support for each other, and we hope you'll engage throughout. In addition to the information and ideas we'll share, we hope this hour might offer you a chance to take a break from the critical work that you're doing in extremely trying circumstances and to know that you're a part of a network of thousands of people doing similar work all across the country. We know that all of us are currently coping with the COVID-19 pandemic in our work and in our personal lives, and that that may be front of mind right now. Um, as there's a relationship between the virus and diabetes, we'll be talking about it some during our chat today. But for more conversation about COVID-19 in the context of healthcare for the homeless, join us for the Council's COVID coffee chats, which take place each Tuesday and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern in the coming weeks. You can find a registration page along with a number of materials on COVID-19 and homelessness by the Council and our partners in the resources box on your screen. This coffee chat series on diabetes was developed by the Healthcare for the Homeless Clinicians Network, which is the nation's largest network of providers of hands-on care to people who are homeless. The network helps members connect, learn from each other, and share best practices across the homeless healthcare field. If you're not already a member of the Clinicians Network, please join from our website, or the Council's website, nhchc.org slash join. Um, the Clinicians Network also has a Facebook group that's open to its members, and um, you'll be able to join that after joining the network itself. So some instructions about how you can engage during the chat today. We want to hear from you, and we welcome your questions and stories throughout the chat. One of the best part of holding these chats is getting to hear about people's work from across the country. So you can type directly into the attendee chat pod on the screen. Your comments will show up to all participants, and I'll refer them and the questions that you post to the panelists as they come in. So first up, let's see who we've got in the room today. I'm going to post a poll question on your screen. Where you can click right on the screen and sh let us know what type of organization do you represent. Are you part of a Healthcare for the Homeless program? Do you work for another health center? Um, an, a shelter, another service provider? Are you part of government? We'll give a moment for everyone to respond. So it looks like um, many of us are from health centers today, um, and some from healthcare for the homeless programs specifically some from shelters, and some from other service providers. Great, thank you. And I've got one more poll question I'll post in just a second. Okay. 
And this is about your specific role. You can click on this screen to respond right now, but are you primarily a clinician, an administrator, a consumer? Do you work in government? Do policy work or advocacy? Or something else entirely? It looks like um, we have fairly equal numbers of clinicians and administrators, and then some doing other types of work, too. Thank you for responding to those. Um, before I introduce today's panelists, I want to point out a few relevant resources that are available for you in that resources box on your screen. Um, the resources section has a link, that top link that I mentioned it has all of our COVID-19 resources, and below that has a page of diabetes-specific resources, um, including the adapted clinical guidelines on recommendations for the care of patients experiencing homelessness at risk for or diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, there is also a guide on nutrition and diabetes, how medical nutrition therapy can improve diabetes management, as well as links to fact sheets related to diabetes and archived webinars that we've created in the past. So by clicking on the diabetes resources link on your screen, that will open the council's webpage that has all of those um, resources available for you to, to download today. So please um, help yourself and make use of those um, if they're relevant to you. Now I'm very happy to introduce you to our panelists today. We have Sandra Ar Aravelo Valencia from Montefiore Nyack Hospital in Nyack, New York. Elizabeth Murphy from the University of Chicago Kobler Diabetes Center in Chicago. Katie Smith from Yakima Neighborhood Health Services in Yakima, Washington, and Christina Watts from Foothills Health and Wellness Center in Clay City, Kentucky. Welcome and thank you all so much for being here today. I am going to start our discussion questions and in the first one, I hope you'll um, tell us a little bit about your organization that you come from and the work you do. So let's start off with can you tell us about the services your organization provides and your specific work related to diabetes and nutrition? Sandra, would you get us started? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, and first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'm glad to see some names uh, of people that I know in the participants list. That's exciting to know that we're talking to so many people. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit of, about myself. Uh, I've been a dietitian for 20 years. I'm also a certified diabetes educator. And I was working in the South Bronx in a community health center for the past 15 years uh, for Montefiore Hospital. Now I have moved to Nyack, New York, to the Montefiore Nyack Hospital. So I, I was taking care of uh, outpatients. Uh, for 15 years now, we're doing. A, I'm doing a little bit more work with the inpatients. However, you know, in in both uh, jobs, I I was and I'm still taking care of a lot of homeless uh, people. Unfortunately, uh, what do we do in the outpatient world? We uh, provide services for, you know, medical services, OBGYN, nutrition, physical therapy, case management, social work, mental health, and then same in, in the inpatient, outpatient in the hospital that I am right now. And um, unfortunately, you know, now due to COVID, we've seen that the needs for a lot of these patients have grown immensely. I guess we'll talk in more detail about that later. But that's in a nutshell the work that we've been doing. Together with having uh, food pantries that we manage that help um, 
people who don't have a home right now. So, yeah. Thank you, Sandra. And I'd also like to invite all of the participants to use that attendee chat pod and let us know where you're from and what, how your, relate, your work relates to diabetes and nutrition. Um, and Christina, could you tell us about yourself and the work that you do? Uh, yes. Um, think, and also thank you for having me as well. Um, I work with a clinic in um, Clay City, Kentucky. We are a rural, um, federally qualified clinic, um, but we're in a rural area. I work as the dietitian. Um, and also do care coordination. Um, our clinic offers primary care services, uh, mental health, substance abuse, and uh, nutrition services. Um, so I'll provide MNT, and we're also working on um, our, a diabetes program. Um, so we'll also be offering the DSME classes as well. Um, things have changed a lot for us as far as um, with everything with COVID. We are still trying to see um, some preventative services, but we've switched over to telehealth. And we are also going to be starting a drive-through um, screening process as well. Wow. Thank you, Christina. Katie, could you tell us about yourself and the work you do? Hi, uh, good morning. Well, for me, good morning, I guess, good afternoon or whatever time of day it is for everyone else. Thank you for having me. This is a new experience for me to, to speak on this kind of platform. Um, I am, uh, my title is Nutrition Services Director here at Yakima Neighborhood Health, Health Services, which is a federally qualified health care center um, here in central Washington. Uh, we offer medical, dental, vision services. Um, we also have um, behavioral health um, specialists. We offer public health programs like WIC. Um, and we have a very, we're fortunate enough to have a very large um, outreach and homeless services division, um, which includes uh, medical, uh, dental, behavioral health site for um, those with housing instability. We have a medical respite center, so those that are not sick enough to stay in the hospital but too sick to really be left um, without a home. Um, we also have um, permanent supportive housing, including a transitional housing site. Um, my role is um, overseeing basically anything nutrition related. So um, MNT, um, our WIC um, portion, also working with um, our outreach resources through a SAMHSA grant. We have um, uh, dietitians that work. Uh, we see patients both at some of our homeless outreach sites as well as um, in, in clinic. Thank you. Elizabeth, could you tell us about yourself and your work? Thanks, um, and thanks everyone for being here. My name is Elizabeth. I work as a registered dietitian and diabetes educator at the University of Chicago. I used to work at a federally qualified health center in Chicago called Heartland Alliance Health. Uh, and my work that I do now, the University of Chicago Hospital is based in the south side of Chicago, so we get a lot of our patients from that neighborhood. I work on, in our outpatient endocrinology clinic, and we also get a variety of patients from all different backgrounds and socioeconomic status from all over like central Illinois, northwest Indiana, southwest Michigan, um, so it's, it's now, the work I do now is a little bit different, but uh, it's really really interesting to see all the different ways that people are able to access resources related to diabetes care. Thanks, Elizabeth. So let's get into some of the major challenges related to diabetes and nutrition that people experiencing homelessness face. Um, and how about we sort of take these one by one. Um, Elizabeth, would you share sort of a primary or a main challenge that you have found in caring for people experiencing homelessness? Sure. One of the main challenges that I've found is having access uh, to being to resources to be able to prepare foods or if you're getting foods at uh, meal sites to be able to make those choices at those 
uh, sites to say like, oh, could I have an extra serving of vegetables and less of less bread or even at food pantries as well, trying to make those healthier choices um, can be really, really challenging because it's, it's like one more thing to have to worry about and one more thing to have to, to advocate for yourself about. Um, and I think that that can, be, that can be really, really challenging. But ways to work through that is working with those pantries or soup kitchens and trying to have those agencies, um, you know, change the way that the food is served or change the way that uh, making it more client choice or participant choice so that people have the agency to be able to, to choose those healthier options. Thank you. Sandra, what would you share as a main challenge that you've seen related to diabetes and nutrition for people experiencing uh, homeless? Definitely access to food is one of the most popular ones that I see. There are, there are two things, actually. One is access to food. Uh, definitely when you have diabetes, you have different needs than the, than the majority of the population, right? Um, nobody who doesn't have diabetes needs to worry about what to eat for every single meal as opposed to people with diabetes who have to think more than twice sometimes what the next meal will be, living alone where it will come from and if it's going to be of good quality. So having that access to quality foods is one of the most popular barriers that I see to nutrition care. However, there are other things that also are bothersome, and one of them is access to physical activity and many people might be just thinking well you can just exercise from home or just walk or go up and down the stairs but if you're living in a shelter or you're living in in on the streets or in a neighborhood that isn't safe you know a lot of people don't have the luxury to even walk on the streets so that's another challenge in in a major one is lack of access to to a home, you know, in the sense that, for example, if you have to use insulin and you're going to get your insulin refills and you have to leave your insulin in a refrigerator, but you don't have a home, even less a refrigerator, then where are you going to leave your insulin? So there are many different types of barriers that we see. Uh, you know, I think that even though the nutritional barriers are very important and daily, we always have to look at all the barriers together because it will not make a lot of sense to just coordinate resources for the nutrition barriers, you know, and maybe try to get people like fresh fruits and vegetables when there is not even a refrigerator where to put the fresh fruits and vegetables or the insulin or they're not going to be able to exercise or walk. So I think that when we take care of, of people with diabetes, we need to look at them as a whole, ask a lot of questions about what the needs are and, and try to target each one of them because at the end they are all intertwined and we need to take care of them all. That's a great point about um, how all these things are related to each other and the importance of keeping of taking that holistic look at the situation. Um, Christina, what would you add to the, the list of major challenges related to nutrition and diabetes? Um, I would definitely agree with Elizabeth and Sandra. We definitely um, see some of those same issues in our clinic. Um, two of the other things that we deal with a lot are um, transportation and communication. Um, because we have, where we're in a rural area, a lot of our patients lack transportation to be able to travel um, to for you know specialty services, hospitals. 
uh, our our county does not have a hospital. One of our counties, we cover two counties here in Kentucky, and one of our counties doesn't have um, a hospital in it, but there are some touching, but it's still hard for them to access that um, if they need it. Also, um, many times you'll see people, you'll see them in clinic once, and when you go to reach out to them again, they won't have access to a phone, or if they have a phone, uh, they won't have minutes on there. So it's very important when they're here to try to ask for uh, somebody that they might be staying with or a relative or somebody that they that they might be able to get in touch with uh, just for medications or trying to make sure they're they're able to check their their blood sugar or making sure they have the resources available to them and again with that that also goes with food access they are not able to access transportation to get food um, or they're you know they, they might have a place to stay for one day and, and not knowing where they're staying the next. So it's, it's a very hard challenge. Uh, we have tried to address it by providing some transportation for medical visits uh, or maybe to a food bank locally. Um, and then again, just trying to make sure we have multiple forms of access of communication with them to follow up. It doesn't always work, but uh, we are we try to be very aware of uh, possible uh, ways to contact them because it can be very hard to get a hold of them for follow-up. That's great. Katie, would you add anything to this list of challenges? Well, I think that the other professionals did a really good job um, covering a lot of the challenges. Um, I think the only thing I would really add to any of that, I mean, I second everything they said. Uh, we see it true here um, in our community. Um, I would say definitely, it's actually ironic, I, I met with one of our, um, one of our patients in our um, transitional housing unit yesterday, and I actually asked him, I was like, okay, I'm about to speak to a bunch of professionals on this. If you could have them know, you know, what is a challenge you faced based before he was um, on the streets homeless, using relying on a shelter for two years, um, and then is now in one of our transitional housing. And he pointed out that um, something that's different, I mean, he's had all scales, is everybody is different. Um, the word homeless doesn't just mean you don't have a home, right? So going in, um, understanding the challenges of what that means for that patient, um, prioritizing need based upon where they're at. Um, and then also, um, I would say um, another challenge, I agree with the transportation and being able to reach out. But that also goes hand in hand with that prioritizing need. When you um, are just prioritizing getting food, you're not worried necessarily about, okay, well, what's the carb content in this? And you know, if you're worried about somebody not um, abusing you, you're going to be a little less likely about, well, did I have my non-starchy veggies? So it's um, being able to use motivational interviewing to the next level to really see not only what's important. Um, to these folks, but also kind of meeting in the middle as to what you think versus uh, what their exact situation is. Um, so that's really the only thing I've had everybody else covered, the, covered it pretty well. Thank you, Katie. I think that point of really um, listening and being, paying attention to the specifics of an individual situation is really critical. Um, let's sort of go back to some of the strategies that you all have found to these common problems. Um, what are the things that have been helpful that you've seen? Um, and let's go back to the, the access to food one first. Uh, Elizabeth, you talked a little bit about working with food pantries and kitchens um, on sort of the way they are offering food, but um, do you want to say more about how you've worked how you've seen that, that partnership be successful? Yeah, sure. Um, something that comes to mind is a, a program through the University of Chicago they have. It's called the Southside Diabetes Project. And so I know that it's, it's, all, it's more than just access to food, but this, this specific program does focus mostly on access to food. So a co couple of the interventions they have is they have like a grocery store tour day at the Save-A-Lot grocery store. 
uh, a couple times a month that people can go to for free, just walking through the grocery store, learning about reading food labels and where to find food. They also do, like at the little farmer's market, they have uh, produce, like a Veggie RX program. People can get produce, um, and then there's cooking demonstrations, also like a pop-up table where they talk about diabetes care and nutrition. Again, I, I realize this isn't uh, fix, like fixing everything, but it's a good start, I think, of having people being aware of what food options are available to them and then also uh, doing the Veggie Rx so people are able to, you know, get those fruits and vegetables if they are able to um, prepare them or store them all those other barriers, too. Thank you. Christina, would you like to add any, anything about um, successful strategies you've seen to help address um, the challenge of access to appropriate nutritious food? Yeah, um, we have done, I like, um, we did a, uh, with our farmer's market, we did a, a veggie voucher program for the last two years to try to increase access to some of our patients that had um, chronic diseases and, and low access, and that seemed to work really well for our patients. Um, our clinic also does emergency food boxes for patients that need food or don't have access to it right away, and in that time, we also do screenings at their visit to see what kind of um, limits they have to access food and try to pair them up with community resources to um, maybe get them on um, a SNAP program or uh, just whatever we can try to help them with or identify at that time. Um, and then we also try to give them access to the food banks here and also try to provide transportation if that is also a barrier. Great, thank you. Katie, um, do you want to add anything about um, think ways that you've seen be successful in addressing access to food? I think the biggest thing um, is knowing the local resources that you have that are available to um, your patients and those that you serve, um, but then also working with the, your person and educating them on what the resources are. Um, I think it was Christina who said that, you know, trying to limit the barriers to getting them access to food and then from there figuring out what they actually get and then working from there on an individual basis. Thank you. Sandra, would you like to add anything? Yes. Actually, um, a lot of people that we work with are somewhat embarrassed to go to food pantries at churches or other emergency food pantries where you have to stand online for a few hours. You know, you get noticed by everybody in the community and, you know, they kind of get pointed at as, as being needy and hungry. So something that has helped us a lot in the South Bronx is to have like a, a small emergency food pantry as part of the community health center because it's a pantry that is for our patients only. And patients feel very comfortable actually coming to the providers and the dietitians and saying, I need some food. They know that they are going to get the food right away. They don't have to stand online or anything like that. So it, it helps them to overcome that feeling of, of shame in a way. Um, something else that we have incorporated with the food pantry is we have been able to give them recipes and a cookbook. A lot of the families in the, that are homeless in the South Bronx, they live in shelters, they live in shelters in New York City, and in the shelters they only have a microwave available, and that's all they can use to cook. So when you give them food, you know, most of the time they don't know what to do with the food. They don't even have a can opener to open cans with. So we provide can openers and we provide a microwave cookbook together with the food. We do microwave cooking classes at some of the shelters. And these classes help 
patients or, or people tremendously because now they know what to do with the food. They can eat foods made from scratch that are healthy, that they can make with the foods we are providing. And we also do workshops on meals on a budget so that way they can manage their finances better. And something else is to provide nutrition education at every outpatient or inpatient visit. So we just set up a table outside in the waiting room, or if they are inpatients, we offer this nutrition education for every patient who's here who has diabetes. And, you know, instead of waiting for the patients to come and seek the dietitian, the dietitians just go to the patient and they make themselves available to answer any questions. They have little demos over there. And believe it or not, people really get attentive to the information that are provided. And it helps to establish that relationship with the person and the dietitian and defeat those barriers of you know, having to make an appointment, having to come back. They're just done right there and then, and people can get all the information that they need. It just starts like a casual conversation, but it can turn into a, into a visit. And, and they uh, end up asking a lot of questions about nutrition and diabetes. So incorporating these visits into other visits or other programs that are happening just casually helps to defeat that barrier of access to a dietitian and nutrition education. That's fantastic. Um, and I loved your example of giving can openers and microwave cookbooks. Um, Sandra, you also mentioned um, the challenge of not having refrigeration available and how that can um, ha impact food and then also the ability to store insulin. Are there ways that you all have found to address that specific issue? Well, at least, uh, you know, for some of our patients, we have been able to store the insulin in our health centers. Uh, but also other ways is to work with social workers, with case managers to find like a health proxy or a friend or somebody who can storage the insulin for the patients to make sure that they're going to have access to the insulin. You know, especially if people are living on the streets, they need to know that, you know, every so often they're going to need a new pen that needs to be refrigerated. So to help find that person or that storage for the insulin is very important. Sometimes patients don't realize that they need some help. You know, they, they need a support group, they, and, and not just in the sense of a, a support group where you go to get support, but more so like a community support, like the support of friends and family, at least just to be able to store some of the insulin and medications and even food. So I, I had the case of a patient once where he will store his food at a friend's house and she allowed him to go there and cook once a day, use her kitchen, and just take food with him every day. So, you know, this is the kind of challenges that we need to overcome and we need to work with patients and friends and family of those patients to be able to create you know, that support network to help them survive those circumstances. That's great. Thank you. I'd also like to invite any of the participants, if you would type in the attendee chat and share any programs that um, you've got in your community to help people access food or to deal with some of these challenges that we've been talking about. We would love to hear about what you're doing because I'm sure there are some creative ways that you are responding um, and we'd love to know about those too. Um, I want to ask our other panelists also if you have anything to add about, um, you know, after you've worked with an individual to learn the specifics of their situation and their needs and their priorities, um, are there um, any, is there anything else you want to share about um, ways you've come up with to, to deal with these cha particularly uh, challenges related to the context of not having a home in managing diabetes?
anyone want to share anything else? I would say that Sandra made it. This is Katie. I'm Sandra made a really good point with um, definitely utilizing the community around the participants you're working with. Um, I find that when I try to, I don't know, back in the day it used to be called cold call, but when you just try to go and approach somebody, hey, I'm here to help, um, I find that our, our homeless population is a lot less trusting. And so um, being um, either having somebody that they trust vouch for you um, or even potentially for a while be your liaison until you gain that trust um, is, is, a, and it is an important factor. And then I guess medically, um, MNT-wise, um, we've worked a lot about um, if our participants have like SNAP benefits on food budgeting and talking about non-perishable options um, that wouldn't be too hard for them to transport with them throughout the day. This is Christina, and um, I like the point that Katie brought up earlier too about uh, when you ha when you see your patients um, asking all the questions and meeting the patient with they where they are with the motivational interviewing and um, seeing what priorities they have because a lot of times we walk in with um, what priorities we want to cover and especially if you've seen them multiple times like you have ideas in your head about where you want their treatment plan to be and stuff but you have to be able to meet them where they are and see what they're capable of um, doing as far as checking blood sugar and having access to food. Um, that way you can try to come up with a plan together that's gonna, that they're actually going to be able to be successful with rather than just kind of coming up with your ideas and sending them out the door. That's a great point that it has to start with the individual's specific goals. Um, another challenge that came up um, when we initially went around was the access to physical activity. Um, Sandra, you mentioned a couple ideas. Do you want to share a little bit more about um, ways you've helped people come up with to, to incorporate physical activity? Uh, well, really it's more of a, of a challenge that is, you know, at least for my community, it's really hard to defeat because, again, it's matters of safety. Like, People just don't feel safe walking around in the neighborhood, um, or they don't have equipment at home, obviously. I mean, let's just say, of course, if you don't have a home, you're not going to have equipment. But some of the, the things that we found to work around and help is to have different programs offered for, for uh, people who need physical activity in our health centers. Easy to say like Zumba in the waiting room with a Zumba instructor or we also can offer dance classes, hip hop, things that attract the community that are not just per se, just physical activity. Uh, yoga we've done, we've also, um, let me think, there is something else. Oh, we also partner with different organizations in the community to offer some scholarships, especially for their children, let's say for karate or, you know, basketball, soccer programs. There are after-school programs for some of the children, so we have been able to partner with other organizations to be able to offer something, you know, to, for these families. So for children, it's a little easier to find organizations that are willing to work with children, but you know, you need to be a little bit creative, um, sit ex sitting exercises and stuff like that. Like we create just handouts with different exercises that you don't, all, all you need is like a chair and a, you know, two feet by two feet of space in order to exercise a little bit. So. Going back to the motivational interviewing and meeting patients where they are, I think that it's also important to let patients know that, you know, you don't need to join a gym, you don't need to run a mile. As long as you move a little bit with whatever you have, that is what's really important and just to start from there. Just, but it's important to know what they like to do. Like if they like to dance, then dancing will be their exercise. If they like yoga, you know, that will be the exercise. And, you know, maybe just 
the cleaning around could be a type of exercise. So you just have to be very creative. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists want to share examples of um, ways you've seen um, help people incorporate physical activity? Sure. This is Elizabeth. Um, I definitely agree with everything Sandra just said. And some, sometimes it's knowing what options there are, too. Like the Chicago Park District has an exercise prescription program where Somebody, someone's doctor can give them a referral so they can go to the park district and exercise for free. Or sometimes different hospitals will have um, like exercise activities, again, like chair exercises or low impact physical activity. So it's a matter of, of knowing what, what resources exist in the community and then, and then connecting people to those resources. But I also 100% agree that sometimes people think like, oh, well, I can't go to the gym, therefore I can't exercise. But exercise can be any way of moving your body. It doesn't have to be um, like going on a run. So I think that's a really important message to convey to people as well. Sure. Christina, anything you'd add about physical exercise? Um, Really, I think what one of the best things that we can do here is know what resources are available out there um, and try to encourage people to use those. Like I know sometimes our extension office will do um, free or very low cost exercise programs uh, for a period of, of time. Um, and then just, again, working with the patient and seeing what they have access to or what's around, what they can do, whether it is just getting up and walking um, around their, like small amounts, um, just encouraging more movement throughout the day. Uh, but it really, it really is just dependent on what the, the patient has access to. Thank you. Katie, anything you'd like to add? Um, just one more idea that actually presented itself um, through this COVID um, stay at home that we have going on. Um, I have a, a a patient who um, she was reliant on walking um, and she actually was often on couch surfing with friends but she had recently gotten into a long-term motel um, and so we worked together she didn't feel comfortable because um, there was a lot of people like hovering around outside and she just didn't feel comfortable walking um, any longer and so we brainstormed together and she has free Wi-Fi at the motel so um, we using her smartphone doesn't use any of her minutes she just linked up to her the Wi-Fi at the hotel um, and some of our patients have found that you don't even have to be in the hotel to access their Wi-Fi. Um, but uh, looking at free YouTube videos, um, there's tons of walking and dancing, and, and you don't really need much space. And so she found a couple um, walking DVD or walking YouTube videos that she liked that doesn't, they don't cost her anything, and they don't use any of her phone minutes. So um, that's a helpful idea. That's so creative. Uh, let's switch now and sort of focus in on the effects of COVID-19. Um, several of you referred to how it's changed the, the work that you're doing. Um, so how are the needs of people with diabetes impacted by the pandemic? And I'm particularly curious about are clients in isolation and quarantine sites able to manage their diabetes and access food that meets their care plan needs? And any other issues that may be addressed uh, or may need to be addressed? Um, Katie, do you want to start there? Uh, yeah. So um, for our general um, population, we've seen that, I mean, everything is telehealth now. Um, I, we've had a few of our um, diabetic patients in, um, over the phone telling us that um, it really has affected um, their way of eating, not necessarily medications. I, and for me, I haven't had many patients say that that's an issue, but it's the it's the actual nutrition, the eating out of boredom, the eating out of stress, the, oh, I got so busy trying to distract myself with this that I didn't eat. So really um, having to let them know that we are in extraordinary times, but to remember that our body is needs to maintain ordinary. Um, and then as far as our um, housing unstable um, homeless folks, 
um, we've been doing a lot of outside discussion, maintaining social distancing, um, because for them it's not as easy to have this appointment tele and this appointment tele. Um, and so um, we've been getting really creative. I've relied a lot on our outreach and our housing services um, um, division to help us um, reach those patients. Yeah, there's a lot of creativity going on to, to respond. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to share about how you've seen the impact of COVID play out? Sure. Uh, we're also doing telehealth visits, and I feel like the most challenging thing is um, our doctors really want to know what people's blood glucose readings have been and want them to, like, upload their data. Uh, so the clinic can see it, but it's just not realistic. Uh, I feel like I'm mostly tech support for people. So even just having people go through their blood sugar meter and, and read me what the last few days of their blood sugar values have been, um, it's been a lot. Or even when talking people through, like, how to do things, um, whether that's, like injecting insulin or checking your blood sugar and doing that over the phone I find to be really, really challenging. Um, but it's been a good learning experience, I guess. Thank you. Christina, would you share about the impact of COVID that you're seeing? Um, I, again, we also have switched over to t more telehealth visits. Um, I had also done chronic care management, so following up with our patients as far as um, their blood sugars and trying to do um, checks on them to make sure they have follow-up appointments scheduled, um, kind of explaining to them how it, how it occurs with the telehealth visits, um, making sure they have access to medications and um, blood sugar readings. Um, it's, it's really just switched over to a lot of, uh, of follow-up and, and questions and making sure they have the resources that they need. And then if they don't, trying to link them up with those resources um, as soon as possible. Or, or if their blood sugar has been running excessively high, trying to get them in for a telehealth visit as soon as we, we can. Mm -hmm. Sandra, what, what can you share about the impact of COVID in your community? Well, um, in terms of emergency food, there has been a a great increase, like about three times the people that were asking, were using our emergency food pantries before are coming now. So definitely the need has changed tremendously and has increased tremendously. Now, in we've also moved to telehealth for outpatient visits. Some people like it, some hate it. So, you know, a lot of the patients that we that used to come for their visits are not accessing services anymore, especially the elderly are definitely technologically challenged or a lot of them we don't have a contact information to contact them, like the phone numbers have changed or again they have no minutes. So it's hard for us to reach out to a lot of them. Then from the inpatient point of view, we definitely see that a lot of people who have gotten COVID, you know, they have diabetes, they have high A1Cs, and the higher the A1Cs, the poorer the prognosis. So unfortunately, that's something very sad to know that definitely people with diabetes have been highly impacted by COVID-19 in a unfortunate, bad way. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to invite, again, any of our participants to share how things are going in your community and the impact um, you're seeing of COVID on people with diabetes. Also, thank you to Caitlin Sinovic for pointing out um, when we were in the discussion on physical activity about um, a something that their community has um, where the local YMCA offers gym memberships based on income. So that's a way to um, access the gym for um, people, particularly on SSI, it looks like they can um, 
join for $12 a month. So neat to see the creative ways different communities have responded to needs out there. I want to ask you all a little bit of a different question from when we were talking about the challenges that people experiencing homelessness face. I'm curious what you each find most challenging about the work you do. Um, so maybe similar issues, but um, more sort of uh, about your personal experience. Um, Christina, would you like to start us off? Um, I think one of the, the most challenging is um, sometimes when you have lack of resources trying to um, come up with creative ways to try to meet patients' needs because sometimes um, you might, especially currently where there are more people that are needing access to food, um, you just got to try to work with, with your outreach team or with uh, case managers and, and, and everything to try to address those needs. Um, again, like with the communication, uh, trying to follow up with patients, um, it's, it's just hard to try to, to try to meet those needs sometimes, so trying to come up with the most creative ways. Um, that's why I like uh, opportunities like this where you can hear what other clinics are doing um, across the country. A lot of times you hear ideas that you hadn't even thought of um, that maybe you can try to implement. Um, so I really encourage people to try to take advantage of learning from other, um, other practices, other clinics, and seeing what other people are doing because a lot of times, I, I know just working with some of these in the past, I've gotten some great ideas that have definitely helped with um, some of our patients. Great. Sandra, what do you personally find most challenging? Um, well, to me, it, you know, just to say it in a word will be readiness, and readiness in two ways. It could be because the patients aren't ready to make any changes, and you try so hard, and you do a lot of motivational interviewing and education and all of that, and the patients still don't make any changes just because they are not ready, and you know how important it is for them to make changes. And, and it, you know, and you just keep trying and trying, but they're not there yet. So that's one way. But then the other way is, again, that lack of resources, like sometimes you just, feel that you're against, you know, like swimming against the current, trying to find all these resources, and nothing seems to be either enough or good for the patient. And, you know, it feels sometimes like you want to do so much, but you can only do this much, you know. And that's, to me, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Elizabeth, what do you find most challenging? Actually, Katie mentioned this earlier, um, but trust, um, building that relationship and, and having people feel comfortable talking about what their social situation is or what, um, what challenges they're facing and, and what things they would be ready to change or willing to change. And I think that you know, without having that baseline relationship or that trust, then, then those conversations are a lot more challenging to have. Um, so that's a really important building block, a really important piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Katie, how about you? What's most challenging? Um, I think the, the previous two ladies um, did a really a really great job explaining exactly that. It's the access to resources, the person's perception, readiness to change, the relationship building in a much less trusting population. Um, but I think that for me the biggest challenge is um, diabetes management, of course, as we know, is a lifelong thing. Um, but also in particular in our specialty of nutrition, you know, nutrition is a daily choice, right? We are constantly having, it's not like it's something that we, you know, have to can just instantly avoid, and it goes away. We have to manage it every day, um, and in particular for diabetic patients. And so, when we're working with um, people with housing instability, you know, it's very hard. Like you could make progress, and then next thing you know, another stress point comes up for them that then backtracks you so much. So 
in really working with that motivational interviewing and, and having a and really giving that person self-efficacy is very difficult to do when they've got a lot stacked against them. Um, and so even when there's a readiness to change, what you spoke about last week could be completely different than what you need to focus on this time. So it makes it very difficult to build on that um, nutrition component. Thank you. And I thank you all for your candor and honesty about how challenging this work can be and, and the situations that clients are often in. We have just a few minutes left here. Um, thank you to Darlene for also sharing another idea in the attendee chat um, for strength chain training that folks can use canned goods as weights or bleach or laundry detergent or anything that might be available. Um, or as Sandra points out, um, moms with small babies can use the babies as weights. Um, to help with bonding and also get exercise. So lots of creative ideas that people are sharing. So thank you. Um, before we close today, I wonder if there's any final advice that each of you would give to others working with clients experiencing homelessness who have diabetes. And Elizabeth, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I guess knowing that this is a, like Katie was just saying, this is a chronic disease. This is a, it's a long process. It's a journey and not everything's going to be solved in this, you know, one hour consultation, but this is an ongoing process and things, things can change and, and people can, can make changes to better manage their diabetes. Thank you. Christina, what advice would you give? I, again, I think the, um, for me, the most important um, thing I've learned is, is really focusing on the patient and letting the patient, you know, um, set their own goals and, and come up with, with what is, what they are capable of focusing on at that point. Because as, as I've stated, um, week by week, things can change. Um, you know, they, their access to food, their home, whether or not they have a home, all that stuff can change so much. So, so letting the patient um, kind of lead the conversation as to what they are uh, uh, um, able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Katie, what advice would you give? Um, in addition to the advice that was given already, um, I would say as a, um, and maybe this is more of a coordinator perspective, but re well, and in clinician, um, becoming, make sure that you're familiar with the local resources. Never quit. Um, there's always new stuff coming and stuff changing and leadership changing. Really trying to stay active in the community that you're trying to serve. So forming those um, relationships with other community partners. Um, and then also, again, I'm, my job becomes a little bit easier because of our outreach team and using them as li li liaison. So I guess in a sense, it's like internal community um, partnership. But um, that would be a, a big thing that I, I would give people advice on or for. That's great. And Sandra, any final advice you'd like to share? Uh, sure. I, I share everything that was said already, but also I would add active listening. You know, every patient has a story. And if you listen actively, you know, they are going to tell you what they are ready to do, what they have access to, what they like, what their needs are, and you just need to help fill in the gaps. And that's going to make your job a lot easier and much more effective. Well, thank you, all of you, for your final advice and for all of the great suggestions um, that you've shared today. This has been really helpful and um, really appreciate you all sharing your experience and your expertise. And thank you to the participants for joining us and for those who shared your ideas and experiences as well. You will all receive a brief evaluation on your screen at the end of the chat. So please take a couple minutes to share any feedback you have so that we can improve and plan future sessions. A recording of this chat will be available on our website in three business days.
so be well, everyone, and thank you again.